Hi, this is Mitch, and this is Through Process. This episode of the podcast is a little bit different than what we usually do. We had designer Martin Vineski visiting RIT on April 24th, and we recorded a live conversation with him and some students in the Vignelli Center at RIT. Because this was a live recording, this podcast is a little bit noisier than most of our other podcasts, but it was a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. So good morning, everybody. We are here with a live studio audience of students and Martin Vineski. Um, and uh, to my left is Martin Vineski and a returning guest, Nancy Bernardo. Hello. 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 And uh, Martin, could you just briefly introduce yourself? I'm Martin Vineski. I'm a graphic designer based in San Francisco, and I also teach design at California College of the Arts. Great. Um, so I've got a bunch of questions. Now, everybody listening to this podcast did not see Martin's talk last night, but I think everybody in the room probably saw Martin's talk last night. Um, so I kind of think the, what, the big question that I wanted to start with was about inquiry. And you talk a lot about inquiry and about how your design process, um, it's not sort of starting with the deliverable or starting at the end point. It really starts with sort of a process of, you talked about how you kind of invent a process and then you just sort of apply it and see what happens. And I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit because I find that really something particularly interesting about how you work. Sure. Um, when I when I get a project, I, I you need to find some kind of way of making it personally interesting to you. And so, um, as, as you start looking at the material, you read the manuscript, you watch the films, whatever uh, it's going to be, you start looking for clues, looking for relationships in your own interests or hobbies or things you collect, uh, ways that you can intersect with the project directly. And I think beginning from there and developing a, a, a body of materials that you want to work with or certain processes that, that might lead into the making. And I, I think a lot of it has to do with the idea of making stuff. And so by finding these intersections, that gives you a way in to start making things in response to the material that, that you're given. And so how did – so do you – I mean, are you typically starting, I think there's like a conversation about kind of content to form versus form to content. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that's very apparently contentious these days. It seems to be like sure. a thing that people are uptight about. Mm -hmm. um, I personally find form to content to be wonderful. And I think that's probably mostly how um, my partner and I tend to work. But I'm wondering if you, I mean, are you really starting from a formal investigation and then applying it to content or are you really starting more from content or how are you kind of broaching that? Well, it can go both ways, but I, when I teach, I really encourage students to not begin with the content so much. I, I feel like uh, that kind of thing is so overrated. That's the standard way of teaching design. You have an idea, you develop an idea, you see how you can formalize that idea, and then you realize the final product. But I'm much more interested in making as a way of thinking. And a lot of making just begins on, in finding formal connections between pieces, between photographs, uh, and and by finding the connections that that seem to resonate, and that's of course hard to describe. Um, from there, it leads to thinking about why do these things connect, and when you start thinking about that, or you start collecting similar kinds of things. And you start asking yourself, why are these things similar? What could work against this grouping of things? What could be an opposition? Then you start developing that. And from there, I think ideas develop. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about that is unexpected ideas develop. If you have to always come up with the concept first and from the concept make the form, then it's very hard to surprise yourself with new ways of thinking about the material. You tend to have the same standard ways of thinking, and I find that really tedious. And I find that, you know, a lot of work that I see where the concept seems to dominate the form is I don't really want to look at it. It may have an interesting or important point to make, but until you can engage the person physically with their their senses, I, I feel that that's that's the key moment when the thinking can begin. So can I, yeah. So, for instance, when you were talking yesterday in your talk about the Passport Project, mm -hmm. that would be an example of um, form to content, where you were taking the word passport 
you know, doing the accordion fold with it and then playing with it, seeing what happens and then realizing, oh, I can apply this towards the content. Would yeah. that be an example? I'm just trying to kind of synthesize the... Right. Uh, uh, it, it's not that I don't understand the content at all. I mean, yeah. I, I, right. I knew exactly. what Passport yeah. was. It's, it's, a, it's an arts organization that creates these artist interactions. In, they pick a neighborhood in San Francisco each year, and artists from that neighborhood set up booths, and people go around and they get some kind of art piece from them. It's, it's something like that. But you know what? When you when you start with that, what can you do but just like draw a map of the city or little pictures of artists? You know, you get into these cliches. So I just started with the word, like you said, and then started just folding things. And then as I was making stuff, just using a process that I was just interested in, apart from this particular application. As I started putting them together, I saw, oh, these different fields of dots and lines look like neighborhoods. Oh, let me put them together like they might look in a map. Let me start cutting them and adding them up. And then I started thinking, oh, that almost looks like a geographical terrain Mm -hmm. of the land. And oh, okay, I see how that fits. And I think it allowed for a much more interesting interpretation and, and a more visually exciting one that could then be applied to all of the materials. I think that's a good example of, yeah, of how that yeah. works. Okay. So how do you teach that? <laughs> right? And, I, and I've got many questions about teaching, but I mean, how do you really... And I know you're doing primarily... You're doing only grad, correct? At this right? point. Now you're yeah. teaching grad students, but I think you guys are all undergrads mostly. Like, So how do you approach that in the classroom? Oh, well, the the... The big class that I teach in in the grad uh, program, and it started as an undergrad class actually, is is a form making uh, class. It's called form, and it's uh, a semester long inquiry into materials. And in fact, what we specifically try to do is remove concept, remove a deliverable. Mm. It it started when I was teaching undergrad. And I noticed I was teaching a type class, and each student was uh, given a, a site around the city to investigate. And when they were told to just go investigate, they would take their cameras, they would draw things, they would tape record things. They were really excited, and they would bring in this material, and it was very interesting. And they were so eager. As soon as you said, all right, now the investigation is over, time to make the poster, you could just see the energy drain, and suddenly yeah. you had these really tired, tortured posters with type stuck on them. And I was thinking, what is happening right here? You know, this moment when it goes from that inquiry, that, that investigation, to making a piece of design is when everything dies. So I thought, what would happen if we never ended the inquiry? If we never said, stop it, kids, it's time to make a poster, and just said, just keep going. And so that's what I did. I I created this class where everyone gets like a dumb material, a box of paper clips, some rubber bands, um, index cards, things like that. And they begin their investigation. And I guide them through it. I challenge them. So they look for um, attributes. They look for ways of documenting, uh, often with the camera, but sometimes through drawing, painting, screen printing, whatever it is. And each investigation built... I got so much amazing work the very first time I did it, and these were um, juniors and seniors, Mm -hmm. that I I couldn't believe the same students who gave me those tortured posters were coming up with these brilliant, pure abstractions of paperness or the way things fold, the way light works through water, the way that color seeps in under doorways, these kinds of things. And it it was so astonishing, I just kept teaching this. And when I moved to the grad program, the first incarnation, which I think was around 2000, um, we decided to make that the very first class at a grad level. And the interesting thing about that class is um, grad students come in and they've all been, a lot of them have been working professionally and they're here at grad school because they want to redefine and and change the world, right? Mm -hmm. Do important kinds of design. And here I am handing them a box of paper clips (laughs) and say, for a semester, you're going to be investigating how wire bends and how you're going to photograph that. And that, that shock, I think, and that removal of all of their tools. Suddenly they don't have type, they don't have layout, they don't have concept. All these things that they were good at and made their career over are removed from them. And they're kind of have to start from zero. 
And although they may start with a little feeling a little either annoyed or intimidated, once they move into it, it is just so amazing to watch of uh, these surprises as they come up with all of this material. Um, interesting thing, because I've been using drawing more and more as part of it. Uh, I was talking to Nancy about this, I think, yesterday. When I asked the students, how many of you are good at drawing? Nobody will raise their hand. And it just astonished me that they wouldn't, that these are students who do visual work and still wouldn't do any drawing. Right. And what you realize right away is that most designers think of drawing as accuracy, drawing that chair, you know, drawing a tree, drawing a human body. And yeah, sure, maybe you're not good at that. I'm not good at that either. But I say you all know how to sign your name, and that's drawing. It's just drawing in the form of letter forms. And we looked at mark making, and mark making is a way of working. So they're, although they're, they don't have these other tools, they're given all of these new tools, which they actually had all along. They know how to look at things. They know to, how to investigate things with their eyes, how they learn how to investigate them with a camera. And then it all develops uh, into something really exciting. And through the entire class, there is no talk of concept. There is no talk of meaning beyond a kind of deeper meaning of like when you see a horizontal line, you automatically think of landscape, you think of ground and sky, that kind of, a kind of primal meaning in how we respond to the visual world directly. And understanding how important that is, apart from kind of cleverness of making jokes in a poster or something like that, and how so much of a deeper connection with an audience can be made by understanding these direct sensations, I think it's a great exercise. And what I found out with the undergrads, when I first taught it with them, they were, so, they were very eager, whereas the grad students were kind of, you know, harumph about this the box of, over box of paper clips. Yeah. yeah, they were over it before we started. <laughs> the undergrads were so hungry for this yeah. because they had gone through three years or two years of concept, 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 and they were like, I have no more concepts. I just don't care anymore. And so you say, don't worry. And you don't need to come up with a deliverable. Everything you do every week is the deliverable, yeah. right? When you look at it all as a body of work, you have the most amazing deliverable you could possibly imagine. And it was, it was so liberating for them, yeah. you know. And, and I don't know why classes like that aren't part of a regular curriculum all throughout the country, but I've never seen a class like that ever held. Right. anywhere else until I the fall when I completely steal that idea. I, I hope exactly you do yeah, I would so love you to I wish a lot of people yeah. would I wish the students that I taught would decide to do it in yeah. the future if they decide to teach too yeah I mean I have a couple of the students in the room right we did the thing where I gave you a little bag of a paper clip or something and, and I used it a little bit more about kind of photoshop and, and you know some technical mm -hmm. But well, we like had to like design game. it and then like take pictures of it. Yeah, so I kind well, of it it's, it's, it's them a little. The, the whole the yeah. whole thing is to take it through an entire semester where they think that they've exhausted all possibilities with this stupid paper clip, and how then to build on it. So you go from paper clip to wire. You go from wire to flexibility. You go from flexibility into other kinds of materials that bend. Mm -hmm. Or you go from from the paper clip to shiny things because you like the way the light is on it. From shiny things to metallic things. From metallic things to the way the sun shines on glass. And you build each thing is to a larger and larger field that you're looking at. But you, so so while it's getting broader, you're also looking more deeply at at the phenomenon and then you learn ways of recording it and using the camera not as something to document but as a way to investigate right. and by going really deeply that way you know the funny thing about it is it's it's actually a very modernist kind of thing to do which most people wouldn't label me as that mm -hmm. but it's it's also removing all the excess and looking deeply and truly into this kind of thing it's actually a kind of exercise that the Bauhaus would have taught right. when yeah, if cameras were more available back then yeah, and I'm interested, in, and I do want to open it up in a second, but I'm interested about um, the use of the camera, mm -hmm. um, because that's something that, 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 again, I do a lot of. Um, I would say practically everything we do starts with a camera, to some, or the camera lives in it somewhere. Like, we very rarely start in Illustrator, I mean, ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, never. We, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm kind of curious about that as a tool, because I do think that, you know, there's sort of the camera for, like, an Instagram brunch, you know, selfie camera, then there's, like... <laughs> photography and Zell Adams photography and then sort of in between those things is really the camera as a like a tool of process or or a generator of form rather mm -hmm. than maybe a recorder of form 
And I'm wondering if you could talk about right. that. A bit. Well, let me ask you, did you use the camera that much when you were using film before digital? Um, a little bit, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. Um, now, I'm of an age where cameras used to have film in them. I'm explaining to the students that it was a strip of stuff. Um, so yeah, I did use film. Um, 35 millimeter and then in gra in uh, undergrad I discovered medium format and the Holga, you okay. know, the craptacular Holga, which was the best horrible thing ever. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of before it was like you could buy it at like a Starbucks. I feel like you could buy a Holga at a Starbucks now. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I did a lot of film and, and even now I will still jump into film here and there. It kind of depends on what I'm doing. Obviously, the digital does different stuff. So. Right. Well, let me start with that. Back to the form class for a minute. When I first started this class was in the late '90s, when students did not own digital cameras. They were very expensive, uh, and so they used photography, uh, but they used it sparingly because mm -hmm. it was expensive. Especially if you're a student, you know, you know, film actually you had to then take to a store and get it processed, and that cost money, and you get prints back. You know, all of this. And so not only was it time consuming, because that also added days to the process, but it got expensive to buy the film and buy the processing. So they did, did the camera work, but they also did screen printing. They did a lot of drawing back then, because at that time, design had an array of materials that you could use that were cheaper mm -hmm. than the camera. Uh, as digital photography got, got more and more prevalent, uh, students tend to use that all the time now and now I have to kind of really pull them away from the camera uh, even though I use it all the time myself but to show that there are other ways of beginning and to use drawing not just not doing thumbnails but actually drawing lines and forms and things as a way to begin an inquiry as and, and one thing that I do myself is I'll do drawing and then I'll photograph the drawings and use that as a way of bringing into pho photography so you're right, the, the camera is super important to me, both as a way of designing, but now I'm using it because I do the form thing myself in those pieces that I showed you, the Adobe installations and things, where the I'm just working with these dumb materials too. So the same materials I give the students I have in my office, and I'm photographing them and using light, and then I start building these constructions mm -hmm. uh, with them, and ultimately they turn back into photographs. Um, and in that case, the, yes, the camera is a tool of construction. The camera makes the building blocks, and then the building blocks get put together. And then I put them in Photoshop and construct them all that way. And I consider that a form of photography. And in fact, it's only in the last month or so that I discovered a whole body of photographers who are doing similar kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, where they're really challenging the notion of the photograph. Some are working exclusively in Photoshop. Some are just pulling pieces off the web and printing them out and then working them together and then re-photographing them. And I find that's all this really exciting new way of using the camera as a, a, a middle tool. It's, it's not, it doesn't create the final piece. It creates the in-between pieces that you can then construct in any way you want. And then, then you can use it again to rephotograph or not, depending on how you, how you look at it. So I think that um, I've been complaining a lot because I feel that photography in general and with young people is, has become so ubiquitous as just a recording device. Right. And because it's on your phone and every single event, every single meal, every kind of thing just gets thrown into this vast pool, which is fine. It's great as a kind of diary, but I think that because of the size of the of the camera, it's very hard to use it to really investigate. And I, I warn the students that if they plan to use their phone as their main camera, it's going to be difficult to get super close into mm -hmm. things, to really work with odd lighting, and all. some actually are good at doing it. Right. But it's a challenge. It's a whole different set of challenges. So I don't use the phone camera if I can help it. Right. I always have a regular camera with me. Um, and then I transfer it, I, you know. And now that I've just started using Instagram in the last couple of weeks, so now I have to email myself right. the photos to, so that they come through email, you know, so that I can put them on the phone. It's one of those things. So it's actually more complicated because of that. But you can get it sent out to a lot of people. Yeah. And you're not doing selfies on your Instagram. No, no, I have no interest in sharing my personal life with the world. I only use... 
uh, Instagram or Facebook or all these things as a way of sharing the work I'm doing. Right. Because that, I feel, is my public face, and that's what I'm interested in getting responses by, mm. you know. Yeah. What, what I was thinking, it goes back to the sketchbook idea because mm. we were talking about this yesterday and we were talking about like taking pictures yesterday too. But um, the sketchbook idea, so when I um, ask students to have a sketchbook, I think a sketchbook that's valuable also includes notes and um, like little jotting down ideas. Um, I don't think, so when, when you're talking about thumbnails, I think a lot of students get freaked out because they might not have the drawing skills to do thumbnails. But I always say as well, like the, the, the thumbnails could be little stick figures. You know, I mean, that could be that could be their style too. You know, that could be part of their mark making. Mm -hmm. Do you find that that's a valid way of going about the sketchbook or thinking about sketchbooks? That's how I do it. I mean, I don't draw. I mean, this is this becomes my sketchbook. It's just a book that I always carry with me just for notes and things. But I also fill it with just... A lot of it is typographically based, or I start with letter forms all the time. Because the nice thing about a letter form is you draw five, and it's not a question of accuracy, right? Oh, my God, I didn't do the right five. It doesn't matter. It's just a way to begin. And from there, you start moving to other shapes and forms, and it's a way of continually making marks. And it, it's le led to some larger drawings here and there, um, but it's a way of constantly developing hand-eye uh, relationship. And I, I sometimes think through things, but a lot of times I do this during meetings. Um, and, and I don't think of it as doodling because they all build on each other as a way of, of structuring. So, yeah, they, they could be stick figures. I don't, I don't do that myself. Right. But, but see, I don't, I don't try to make any kind of real things. I just try to look at, at type as a basis for all of that. I mean, in, in here there happens to be a lot of notes, but... But there's a, yeah, but the, the, there's a lot of, of downtime, you know, when you don't. But I, I just look at it as a way of constantly working somehow. And I've actually taken this book and, and photocopied out sections of these and put them in a separate notebook as a as a kind of compilation of these because any of these things may end up being a typographic idea that I'm going to use in a poster somewhere mm -hmm. else, mm -hmm. you know, years from now. Yeah. I don't usually do these because I'm working on a poster or anything, I do these just because I'm always curious. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, look, a new, a new R. I'd never seen that before. Isn't that interesting? Uh, or new way of creating letter forms. And it's always um, fun. That's why I always have to have pens with me. I always make a big deal about mm -hmm. that and having the right pens because there are certain ones that I feel like right, uh, drawing with. Uh, a lot of them are just dumb, cheap pens, like I got this one from the Radisson. The Radisson. Ooh, yes. Le Radisson. Yes. And so, I, you know, and, and I like bad pens sometimes because you get a much lighter line, and it, it kind of skips and drops out, and so you get a different kind of feel with that. And so it's like taking whatever tool you have and really working with it, finding its properties and finding ways to make something out of it. So I do it all the time, and I encourage my students to just make marks all the time. They don't have to be. I think a lot of yeah. them think, oh, they've got to be when I go on vacations. Because you always see in movies when you have an artist sketching, they're always <laughs> sketching the villa in the distance right. and trees. And it's like, that's fine. But you can just sketch just general ideas of like dark and light or up and down or these kinds of things, too. They can be just as interesting. Uh, and as designers, I think those kinds of things can be more valuable to mm -hmm. you. Okay, guys, you want to open it up for some questions here? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. So with, uh, with your presentation yesterday, um, it seemed like you really, without saying it too like flippantly, um, you do what you really want to do. You just do what you do um, when it comes to making art. It's, it's, um, it kind of leads to you're going to make what you think that the project entails instead of you know, if they want, you know, hey, we want you to make a dog, it seems like you're going to, you know, do it your own style. Um, and then that leads into the question where I'm very curious. Um, we always seem to be um, faced with, do we make our personal style uh, show through? Do we go with what we want to make? Or do we make what the, the customer wants to make, or the client? And uh, I was wondering, how do you, how do you balance that? Because, um, to me, the most frustrating part of working with a, with a client is um, the, the rub between, hey, I want to do it this way, and then being with no artistic experience at all, usually, 
um, no, you should do it this way. And most of the time, um, I know I'm right, and they they don't they don't know I'm right. So it's that kind of situation. How do you uh, balance that? Oh, you're so young. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's 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 always a challenge. It's going to always be a challenge in your career until you get to the point where people are calling you just to do what you do, and they want you to do that. Although even if they do that. You get tired of doing the thing you do all the time. I get mm. called and they want me to do another collage with lots of little letters and things. And, and sometimes I really get tired of doing that. I want to start drawing. I want to start doing these other things. But that is what they want. So I, that's what I'll do. I might try to do one drawing-wise. But I, I try to honor what the client asked me for. I really think at this stage in all of your lives... I think you're too young to be knowing what your personal style is, that this is actually the time when you're learning to develop it. So I don't think you're at a point where you can insist on including your personal style in work unless you're trying to figure that out. And I think school is a perfect time to be beginning that. And my developing any personal style has taken me years. You know, I'm fairly well on in my career and I didn't go back to school until I was in my mid-30s and it was only well after that that I really started to develop a process came before style a way of doing things and from there I think that style slowly developed so it's been uh, like 20 years for me to ever get to that point where I can start to feel comfortable and believe me even now I don't know you know, so I'll, t- I'll get a project and like, should I take it through the, that photography uh, way of working or should I start drawing or should I start looking through my old images? And it becomes a, a struggle to decide which direction. And you'll, I'll, I'll, I'll usually have to question the client. I just had one recently where they came to see me about doing this whole identity system. And my question had to be, why me? Why, you know, because I, I don't have a lot of identity systems in my portfolio, so why are you asking me? And what have you seen of my work that you're drawn to? And try to get that information out from them, which gives me at least a, a, a launching pad to move into these uh, different areas. But it's, and also for me too, it's often trying to take some ideas from photography and merge them with some ideas of drawing. And all of that. So, so each time it's it's different. But on a larger scale, I would say the way of making the work continually interesting for you, once you're starting to feel comfortable and you're creating that style, is is let each project be a continuance of an investigation that interests you. So, if you're interested in type and light, for example, and how the two work together, then try to use that as a basis for the next project that you work on. You're going to further your investigations using the project as a way of doing that. Now, they may not ultimately go for it, but you still have the studies that you did, and they still can be in your, in your body of work. And then, so maybe it failed. And and that's happened to me a lot of times when I want to keep going with this idea and I show the client these ideas and they say, well, that isn't really where, you know, we're not really comfortable with that. Like, that's okay. Uh, But I'll just keep those studies. And those are the things that get put up on on the walls or these failed studies because I can use them some other time. You know, so it's it's a continual back and forth and a continually creating of what that style means and how that style may shift and change over time. And I think it has even these new photo constructions. It's a whole new way of working for me uh, that's much more abstract and much more about color and form and shape. But my earlier work wasn't as much about that, but it was about putting things together. So, and in fact, when I do these shows, when I, when I go out and do slideshows, it's a way for me to look at my work and look at what I'm doing now and try to find the lineage. So what you were seeing actually yesterday was me trying to discover why I'm so interested in how these photographs work. And I can go back and say, oh, well, that's what I was doing with these images before, and that's what I was doing with the type and what I was doing with the pictures of the moon. I was putting them together. I was working with structure and then defying that structure. And so, oh, well, that might be a good way to work in the future. So I'm still inventing and still trying to figure that out. And I think most designers, if you're not trying to figure that out, I I like to say, um, then you're repeating yourself. And if you're repeating yourself, you're not 
furthering yourself. And I think you then, I, I feel that design is just really dull and really boring. So it's a chance to constantly re-examine where your interests are and where you want to go and surprising yourself. Okay, I'm going to go the complete opposite <laughs> way. In the way of sort of branding yourself as a designer, how crucial is it to develop a personal style? Because, like, personally, for me, yes, there are, like, different processes or things that I'm drawn to, but I can't really ever find, like, a cons consistent style in the work that I do. How much exploration is sort of needed to develop that personal style, or am I just fine doing whatever I feel like? You're fine doing whatever you <laughs> feel like, I'm sure. Uh, I don't think a style is necessary. There are a lot of designers who, at least they claim they don't. But I think what you'll find over time, and this here again, you're very young, and you've got to give it, you know, give it a decade before you actually put it all together. There'll be certain ways of working with type that you're comfortable with, certain ways of kinds of images that you like working with. Do you like abstract forms? Do you like natural forms? Do you like rigid geometric forms? And as you start to find the things that excite you, and, and when you start looking at the way that you go about designing a project, or the kinds of things that you may do on your own, you'll start to see these gatherings of similar kinds of things. They're not really a style at that point, but they might be a palette of ideas or options. And I think looking at it that way might be a smarter way. Because you might be thinking of style like a filmmaker has a certain flair, a certain way of telling stories. But I think designers can too, and often do. And yes, they often market themselves. But you'll also get the designers who will say on their websites, right, each and every client is unique to us, and we begin with your needs, and we don't try to impose a style upon you. And you know they're lying. You know that everybody has a way of working, a certain couple of fonts that they like to start with, and all of that. But the thing to really separate here for you and for everybody is the difference between design as a creative artistic pursuit and design as a business. And I think it gets mingled all the time in teaching and it always drives me nuts. That's why the formmaking class is about taking an art, art strategy into design. Where art is, you do one thing, you look at it, you repeat it, you adjust it, you see what happens next, you see what happens next, you develop a body of work. That's an art, art strategy for making. A design strategy is you develop your mission statement, you, you codify your work, you get it all looking nice in a portfolio, and you sell it to clients. And I think understanding that it's always this 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 battle between those two things that can make work exciting and I feel that far too much of that business side is is pushed down on students as a career move and when you gotta think of in most cases the design program like the program I teach in is in an art school not in a business school not in a technology school it's in an art school so it really bothers me when all the projects are about the deliverable and about the client and about the presentation and all of that and not very much is given to that just that idea of developing a body of a palette of working materials that interest you a way of of working with type and text and, and content and all of these kinds of things as well in, in a con continual creative pursuit. Because once you start understanding how you do that and how you build on that, you do that for the rest of your life. It's a never-ending thing. Whereas a client project comes and goes and you build a portfolio of client work, as far as visual interest and excitement, it should be something that is just constant in your life and it's a style or a, again a body of work that keeps developing and you keep being interested and excited and if you're not interested and excited then you're doing the wrong body of work you're not doing the thing that, that deeply interests you I have an, uh, another question that kind of deals with like the balance mm -hmm. uh, you spoke a lot about uh, letting things kind of just happen during the design process um, how do you balance that like casual mindset with a rigid like work schedule and find like peace between those things and like oh. take something as far as you can in the time that you have uh well <laughs> in my, my <laughs> lifetime you mean <laughs> you're talking about that 
Um, all right. Well, as far as the ca- the casualness, a lot of the work is meant to appear casual in that I always look at, and this is something I encourage my students to try to make design that looks like it designed itself, to look like it was inevitable and that you didn't have to do anything. And sometimes that can mean highly organized, highly structured, like a perfect geometric structure because there's a logic within it. Sometimes it's just the appearance like that big poster, the AIGA poster with all the letter forms, where it, I wanted it to feel like those letter forms were just groups of people that were moving in this big crowd and they were finding their way up. And then, then I thought, oh, maybe it's kind of like a plant growing. And it started with the idea of, of people moving. And then as, it, as I was working my way up, I started thinking about wow, what about branches? What about a tree? And then it starts to fall from the top. So all the time, though, I didn't want it to look designed with a capital D. I wanted it to have an organic presence that felt as if it was creating itself. And a lot of that takes a lot of intense care and work. It isn't, I mean, one thing I could have done is cut all those letters out and thrown them on the paper. And I always get people who are doing a Vanesky thing, at least they think they are, and do just that. It's like, look, I just did that. And it's like, well, no, that's basically taking a lot of letters and throwing them on the paper. It's like, no, you've got to really think about every single one of them and imagine them all as like characters in a parade or choreography and really pay attention to every single thing. And so that's a way of working slow, but it is that balance between the kind of constructing this thing and making it look like it's not constructed. And I think, again, that's more of an art process because a lot of of art that I respond to looks as if the painting painted itself. Looks like these shapes and forms are colliding or dealing with each other on their own terms, which means ultimately that there is an internal logic going on. Even if it's a logic you don't understand, that these things have come to terms, they have characteristics that are moving in space and they're dealing with, and you as a designer aren't imposing it that I, I have to make it pretty or I have to you know, make it look fun. Is that fun comes deeply from the way these objects are acting towards each other, right? Whether they're cooperating with each other or battling each other, these kinds of things. And, and when you let it happen, that's kind of how you do. And, and, and I, I, I often use filmmaking as a way of thinking about this, that where you see characters in a film where they're talking to each other and they seem to be improvising, uh, either it's highly scripted to make it appear to be improvising and they're brilliant actors that can bring that off. In other words, it takes a lot to make a room look like you just walked into someone's room, right? All kinds of lighting, all kinds of prepping, all of these things. Or the characters are so well rehearsed, and this is a Robert Altman way of working, who's a, a film director who I really admired. I did a book on his work too, where he gets the actors to do a lot of improv together, to learn their characters, and for weeks and weeks, they are just dealing with each other off set as their characters, so that when they get put on set, they're so natural that they just respond like people respond, but heightened. And I think that would be the other way of going, is where you've practiced so much. Like, even if it's gonna throw the letters on the piece of paper, you've practiced that so many times. You've practiced making lines so much that you can just go up and draw that line and it's going to be the right line. But it comes from not just practice in terms of weeks, but practice in terms of years. And so that you eventually develop that skill, which is, again, an art strategy of making. Like, what was, like, one of, like, your biggest, like, struggles in, like, getting to, like, where you are, like, in your design process? I don't, yeah. Uh, Well, I would say... um, one thing is there's there's a process that you can do at school uh, and a process that you can do when you're doing a weird magazine that's no that no one's paying attention to <laughs> but like speak magazine which I did <laughs> um, the the big challenge is can you transfer that process into the commercial working world and it's always a gamble because the way that the working world works is much more rigid than the way that you would fluidly work on layouts with the editor who's just sitting across the room and you can just banter with. 
you know. So, but I think that it is that it's a challenge. And it worked well for me, actually, with the clients I've had. The first big client that I had that I tried this out with was Reebok. And it's a long story about how I ended up designing the, the whole um, installation in this uh, sports convention, the whole Reebok um, um, booth, exhibition booth, which is a huge space. I wor- ended up working with an architect in San Francisco and designing the graphics for that. But, you know, it's a corporation. And here I am. All I've done up to this point was this weird magazine. I've never done anything like this. So all I could do was the exact same thing that I would do normally and something very related to the form studio. What I did is I, I brought a bunch of people. Some were my students, uh, uh, other people who I just knew. And we collected a lot of materials. We went to like junk shops and things and got pieces of metal and mesh. We looked at the shoes. And so we looked at the materials that the shoes were in. We brought in some basketballs and things too, just like, well, we ought to at least have some sports (laughs) things just in case. And we we borrowed this back room at the architect's studio, their workroom. And we put up slide projectors and we had turntables going and we turned the lights out and had all of these lights and colors flashing and we just walked around with cameras this was film cameras back then and we just started shooting and a we didn't know anything about shooting stuff in the dark like this we didn't really know if if it was going to work at all and we just went crazy and we shot um 20 some rolls of film and uh, then we took them we got them all processed and when we got them back we were so blown away but why what we got all kinds of these strange abstractions these kinds of things that like were amazing to us but like okay then I, then we have to show it to the client at least the client's a rep so what we did is exactly what i do in my office now is we just put them up in this grid we covered a wall with them and we we had we went from reds to purples to greens and we just put the whole wall together and we brought the guy in and we just said this is our first exploration we don't know how we would use this, but this is where we're starting. And the guy was just blown away because he was used to seeing pictures of, you know, sketches of athletes looking like superstars, you know, all of these in basketballs and doing all kinds of little type made out of, you know, soccer balls, all this kind of thing. And here we are showing them all of this abstraction in this vivid color. It worked so well. And then that just became a way. So what we learned was... Um, bring the client in at the very beginning and show them where you're starting make them a part of the process so they can be excited too and then build it from there so we never had to really show them three options that kind of thing we just started from there then you know yes we did have to bring in celebrities we did have to bring in sports equipment and things but we could constantly intersect it with this whole (coughs) vocabulary but I guess the point is what you were asking about the struggle is that that fear that it's not going to work and if it doesn't work what do I do so when you're doing something experimental or dangerous like that you always have to build in that chance that they're going to walk in the room and say this is exactly what we don't want you know and you know you've completely missed the the mission of of this whole thing and you're going to have to start from scratch but you know you got to be willing to do it better to find out then Right. Then, you know, three weeks later when we're building this whole thing up and then the whole thing collapses. So, you know, it's a way of working and it has worked pretty well with other big clients like that. Um, Most people who come to see me already know the kind of work I do to some extent. And so they're already, you know, they, they bought into the process more or less. And then it's always really exciting because they they know they want to be involved at the beginning and all of that. But it's always a, a, a gamble. So, since your personal style is shown in a lot of your client work, um, I was wondering if you have any more personal products that you do just for your own, like that you don't really plan on sharing with anyone, just just for you, like a hobby, I guess, almost. Well, I like to share stuff that's not client-based. Like all those photo things that I did after the um, uh, Adobe uh, uh, yeah, after after the Adobe thing, when I've taken them all and making these new photo structures, that's all for myself. Mm-hmm. I mean, those are not for the client anymore. I've used the client work as a as a launching pad, and so yeah, I'm I'm building those out. I'm just about to start a whole new series of photographs 
those building blocks to create new ones that is not client based. I have to do this around client work. But, you know, I just went to the, the same junk store that I w went to way back for the Reebok project. I just went back there and got a whole bunch of new weird metal parts that I'm going to start, you know, shining lights on and doing all of this stuff and then see what happens with it. And, yeah, I will be sharing those. The other project I'm doing that's just for, kind of for myself, uh, I don't know where it would go, is the thing that started with Nancy's project <coughs> about the light the, the electric light versus natural light. And so I've been collecting a lot of postcards. I've been doing reading on when electric lights were first introduced into the urban landscape, how they were received, you know, the history of all of that. So I'm getting the, the ground all put together. And then the next thing I'll do is just what we were saying, just start putting pictures together. Just, so I'm scanning all of these postcards at like a huge percent because that's what I always like to do so that they come in to the the screen so you can't recognize them suddenly a different section of it appears and I'm just going to start putting them together and just watching to see what happens and then come up with ideas so it's going to be a thinking while making but see it's thinking while making but preparing yourself ahead of time so it's not like coming in stupid <laughs> and making it's learning enough about electricity, a lot, enough about the postcards, enough about all of this thing, been, have been thinking enough about it so that you come in with some basic ideas and then you watch to see what happens and let those ideas start to push and pull and lead it in new ways. I don't know what's going to happen, but that's why I'm excited about it. So how do you know when a project is finished then or like when you need to step back? When I have to stop and something else comes along. I, you know, you do have to find endpoints of things. If, if they're client-based, obviously, there needs to be an endpoint. But if, your own, if it's your own project, you don't ever have to stop. Like, I'm never going to say, probably, this is the last photo construction. I've just exhausted it. I need, I need to do this no longer. <laughs> but I, I might say, you know what, I'm going to move towards a drawing now because I've done enough of the photography. Now, now let me take the things I learned from putting all these pictures together and see what happens if I pick up a pen and a ruler and just start working on paper. Will some of that that I've been dealing with lead to something new here? So I think it's always just taking a seed from one thing you're doing and dropping it into the next thing that you want to do. So, so it's a, it's a never-ending process, which is, to me, the exciting thing. You know, the idea of retiring or not, not making visual stuff seems bizarre. Like, why, why wouldn't I? You know, and it doesn't really cost anything. You know, if you're drawing, you just need a pen and a ruler and paper. And you can stay busy forever. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I notice that there is a, it, it, what I assume is a very conscious lack of, let's call it screen-based or interactive mm -hmm. or sort of like programmatic or you know, things of that nature in right. your portfolio that sort of isn't there. Is that just, you're not interested? Or, uh, you know, how, it, you know, that seems like like everybody's figuring out some way to, like, do 3D printing or to, oh. to put stuff in interaction or whatever. And I'm not, obviously that's extremely important, but I do think it's notably absent in your work in a way that I find very interesting. And oh, kind of, yeah. Oh, good, good. I'm good. Not, <laughs> that's not a critique. Like, should that's, I, should that's, I be doing that? Is that what no, you're no, saying? No, not at all. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I, am, I, I, I move through different media all the time. And so, and that's one thing, I, I, again, I share with the students is the, like you can start by drawing and I'll photograph the drawings, take those photos and then put them into a digital and work with them in Photoshop or add illustrator lines to them and then print them out. And maybe then I'll print it out and tear it up again. Like the, the passport is the project I show where it really moves through these different media so the end result isn't media specific in that way it's you know the end result is hopefully something that could be translated into other media mm -hmm. I don't usually get called on to do like websites or you know apps or anything like that but the once you develop a visual language it's not that hard to find ways to get it to move into these others mm -hmm. so the so like the passport things could easily be animated Right. If I want to, I don't do that myself. And I would say, notably, um, like your your front page, your home page on your website mm. does that. You have mm -hmm. those little yeah. animations. I learned how to do gifts. So I learned how to yeah, do so gifts, and animations, and so but they're awesome. And it's like well, it makes sense because it makes your um, what's static, which is something I'm interested in too with my work. 
um, is animating it. Yeah, and, and it when I animate it, I, it, they're all dumb animations too. They're but great. But see, it's the dumbness of it when you put it <laughs> into this environment that makes me smile. It's yeah. like I still like dumb toys. I like you know 3D glasses and looking at old stereo cards because those kinds of things they they we can deal with them physically in a way and it makes us smile Mm -hmm. so it was just funny when i finally learned how to do that i had an intern working for me tim carpenter was the intern and he just said you know doing gifts it's kind of easy and he just showed me it's right there in photoshop there's this whole thing really and so then i was just i just like went crazy and just like wow i can make something Turn upside down and then back right side up. It's it's it sounds so simple and dumb, and of course you're all laughing at me and mocking me. But but you can you can another. I guess what I'm saying is you can do a lot with very little, and just learning this dumb little trick, you can keep yourself entertained forever. And I don't ever have to get beyond that as far as showing that I can do animation if you want. And so yeah, there's a lot of new technology, and I do have to make an effort to keep up with it. Because my students are always moving into that. So they are using 3D printing and they're using laser cutters and things all the time. And I, but I try not to critique it based on the technology, but critique it on what it is you, they want to do. And I don't want them just do a project because, hey, look, I did it in 3D printing when it was irrelevant to that. It's like use it not to make something easier, but to make something that was impossible before, now somewhat possible. Mm-hmm. So uh, so I, I, I still want to push them to the limits of what they're doing because it's not a question of having an easy time with it, right? It's a question of constantly discovering. So now that you made this 3D printing thing, I'll say, what would it be like to use this as something to photograph if you start lighting it in odd ways? Or what if you used it as a drawing tool and actually you know, took the holes in it and you start using it as a template from which to draw and make marks? How would that start to change your ideas? Or how would you start to use 3D printing to create a drawing tool? Right? And so you can take it right back to a more primal thing and then work back and forth in in developing things that way. And I think it's always more exciting to just be looking at technology as a step in this continual investigation of something. I don't think the investigation of the technology as its own investigation is very exciting, at least not to me. It's it on your way to investigating something else. You know, The way that you can make a material more and more porous so that it's almost not there. And if that's something that interests you, then you, it could also interest you in drawing, it could interest you in photography, it can interest you in sculpture, and it can interest you in 3D printing. So you know, I think these larger themes are really where I try to push the students. Now again, I'm teaching grad students, so it's really important that they don't get stuck on technology. Mm-hmm. When you're undergrads, you, learning a lot of the technology is important because you have it in your toolkit. And you may not know where you're going to take it or what you're going to do with it until later. So it's a little bit different, right. you know. Well, and what about the students? You know, it's the 21st century student, and so their technology is so different than what uh-huh. it was like for me when I went to undergrad. And so how do you help push them? Because we talked about a little bit about I have an independent study student who's doing zines, right? Mm-hmm. So we talked about that a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah, and he's yeah, taking yeah. it onto a website, and he's making it kind of interactive that way. But it's like, so zines are, I think, are awesome and old school. But it's like, what can students do that's new yeah. right, and pushing the technology? Right. We talked about that a couple days ago mm-hmm. where I think it's really important, too, that as students, you're aware of your time and place. And so you don't want to make things that are necessarily based on old models uh, but really explore in your own world if you're interested in music let's say to really look at where do you get information about music how do you respond to music what is the visual equivalency of music you don't have album covers now you don't have cd covers but you have other things so we're saying maybe it's the way that you create the live experience and that it's the idea of set design and light design and color and that kind of strategy as far as that becomes the new identity of a performer let's say and in some performers it it is a lot of djs have very specific things they wear or ways that they create the environment and that becomes an identity it has to be designed Mm -hmm. 
but but I would say be careful that it isn't just a retro response because that's what you've seen before, but to really inspect your world and then imagine your world five years from now or imagine where you'd like it to go. If you wish it would be back into print, if you think that print is something that's missing, then find how how does print deal with music today? Not to just look at, can I just recreate Rolling Stone magazine um, or even just a zine the way it used to be because the whole point of zines were originally anti lack of technology because people didn't have computers and so they would just use photocopiers and so then the whole photocopy thing started to stand for grunge even when everyone was using the digital realm and there was this whole confusion and that's what makes it ring so false at least to me but Nancy or I do maybe maybe you do do not know where you actually you know, how you live your lives as a consumer of culture right now. We know how we respond to it, but it's really up to you to become the visionaries of where all of this ought to go. And that's why it's a little weird. It, it, it makes a dilemma for us as educators about what are we going to assign you. Mm -hmm. And we can't just keep, we can't assign you CD covers anymore because it doesn't mean anything to you or make the little booklet. Like, what's a booklet? Um, assigning like a floppy disk design or something. <laughs> yeah, just, right, right, exactly. You know. And so, but, you know, even posters, it's like, well, maybe the whole idea of a poster is irrelevant to you as something printed on a piece of paper because maybe you're more used to seeing information on electronic screens and so I know at a lot of street corners uh, in San Francisco and maybe they have them here too where they have bus shelters where they have screens and they'll change ads and maybe that's what you should be designing posters for a sequence of images that can move through time what drives me crazy about these by the way is the fact that they have this great new technology of these screens and all we get are a bunch of really ugly awful ads that are just designed <laughs> as if it's just a bunch of pieces of paper it's like hasn't anybody thought that we have this technology why not create something that moves or a sequence that makes you laugh or something wonderful no it's just tonight at 11 american idol top 10 it's like <laughs> That is such so much crap. Why are you wasting this technology and telling me this? Why don't you do something wonderful with it? But and so I think it's people stuck in the old technology who is just using the new, but you guys don't have to be there. You guys can say, "Hey, this is the poster for 2015. This is where it might go or this is the venues where it ought to be seen." You know, maybe it's something that's put on this, painted on the sidewalk, as opposed to hung on walls, or maybe it's it's different kind of materials because there are new materials now, new ways of printing that could be more interesting. Another thing we get now are just big, ugly posters on the sides of buildings because they can do it. L.A. is just filled with that, and it's just it's taking the old billboard idea and just sticking it on walls. But there's got to be something new, a new way of looking at it. So I think understanding not just technology but the way that culture is working today in your worlds is really critical because it's moving so fast back in our day um, uh, it didn't move quite as fast so teachers were still in the know I mean there were still something to hand down that was direct and I'm not saying it's not I mean we still look at books I still primarily do book design in my um, in my practice, so I would still teach book design, but we'd also talk about new modes of book design as well. You know, whether it's ebooks or new ways that <clears throat> books might be structured that have more to do with the way that we look at the web. You know, so the book that I did on the designer as was as much about the idea of of surfing on the web and you're constantly being interrupted and you're constantly being, you know, you see a name and you move and you start looking around at that name and before you know it, you're not reading the book anymore. And so it was a little bit about that because that's what yeah, I was doing, great. right? When, great, I was, yeah. when I was Googling all these names and so I decided to put that into the book as a way of at least approaching the, the digital within the book. It wasn't a question of making things look digitally, like using dumb fonts that look like all digital or anything, but using the strategy of how we how we look up material as part of the of the book design or the book experience itself. So, what were we talking about? Was that <laughs> <laughs> where did where did that come from? I don't know. Um, I have one last question, Please. which is um, I'm curious about your influences. Now, obviously, you could, that's like a five hour conversation, but I know you know you did your grad at Cranbrook with the McCoys. Yes, right? it was. And I'm curious, kind of. 
you know, just a little bit about that and kind of, you know, just a couple of names you can drop of people that, like, you're excited about or curious about or... Oh, sure. Well, <clears throat> a lot of it intersects with that, with the whole Cranbrook experience. Um, I, I wanted to go to Cranbrook uh, for a long time, although I didn't quite know why. It had been mentioned to me a lot, and I, I had originally applied back in 80, 1980. Right out of, I went to undergrad at, at Dartmouth College, and then one of the teachers there had recommended Cranbrook, but I had never heard before. Because at the time, the only place that you go is Yale. That's the only grad program there was. But she knew of this one, this new one at Cranbrook. She was a painting uh, person. Um, and I was a, I was a what they call visual studies major when I was an undergrad, so it was fine art at that point. But I knew I wanted to do design. Um, and so I applied, and I actually got in, even though I was still pretty young. And that's when the McCoys were still pretty new there. But I didn't go. I decided that um, uh, I wasn't ready to go back and study. I wanted to be out in the field more and learn more. And so it was much later. It was uh, not till 1990 that I felt that that was the biggest mistake of my life because I was doing work that I was not happy with. It was just, I was doing coupon design. Believe It really was. 25 cent off uh, Spice Islands Cajun Spices. That's, I really was, that's what I was doing. The, you know, the, the shelf card and the recipe booklet and, and the coupons. And I thought, there's, there's got to be something more. Right? At the time, all this other stuff, the Emigre magazine was happening. All these things around me were, were happening. And it was looking really interesting. But the one thing you realize is once you, you kind of put yourself into this niche, you can't just say, now I'm going to be experimental. Right? Look at me. Because like, you don't know how. It's like a tiger that's grown up behind a cage. You open the door and say, now go be a wild animal. And they're like, wait, where's, when's lunch? You know, <laughs> why? So, so I, I timidly called up Cranbrook because it just occurred to me like this flash of lightning that just maybe I could still go. Because for a long time I was thinking, oh, I'm too old, I missed the boat, you know. I was only in my 30s, but, you know, you kind of feel that way. So I called them up and said, do older students go? And they said, yeah, yeah, sure, all the time. So I thought, I'm going to apply. So I applied, but at that point, I only had in my portfolio uh, these coupons at the end. That's what it was. I, I didn't know what to do. So uh, uh, I didn't get in, needless to say. Uh, uh, and I had to spend a whole year taking classes, taking night classes at UC Santa Cruz. So I had to drive down south for an hour, take the class, and then go to work do my coupons. So it's so funny because I was learning, I didn't even know anything about grids or anything. I was learning things about grids and then you design a coupon where <laughs> grids are irrelevant. And I was trying to get all of the legal information onto grids. It's like, and the, the two just didn't line up. I know, it was, it was, it was, it was <laughs> kind of a nightmare. But anyway, I built up enough of a portfolio and uh, one of the people who really helped me that was Lucille Tanasis who was teaching just this weekend workshop that I took and that really just opened my eyes to design, about design as an expressive tool. And it was just two days. But I just worked so hard in that that we kind of became friends. And she, she wrote a letter for me and helped me get in by the skin of my teeth into Cranbrook the next year. And so, uh, and the good thing about that school is that there are no classes. And I was older and I didn't want to, like, I don't want to do, like, final exams. I don't want to go through all that stuff again, have assigned projects and things. And it's really open in that you kind of find your own way there. And the McCoys are artists in residence, you know. And so they were the perfect people for me because they were older and I was older. And we could really understand each other. She was incredibly supportive. I was there as an older student that I was so determined at this point. I just worked like crazy. I just output stuff endlessly. That's just what I wanted to do. I wanted to take advantage of it. And I just lived off campus. I didn't have a social life or anything. It didn't matter to me to do all that. I was there to just learn everything I could. And so, yeah, Kathy was really influential. And another thing about her is that she is not uh, dogmatic. Like, she doesn't come in with an... Uh, uh, of, of, she has a philosophy about education, about design, but it's never... Um, um, demanded of the students at all and she's just learning too and she's someone who went through the whole postmodern but as someone who was observing it in her students happening because she comes from a strict modernist 
uh, background. And so she was learning and watching things happen, and I was learning and watching things happen too. And so it was really useful because it really encouraged you to develop your own process, your own strategy of, of making. The other big influence was Ed Fella, who had graduated just a couple years before, and he was also an older student, considerably older. Uh, when he returned, he kind of retired from, from doing car ads and things. So we also had that in common. He was doing hack work, as he called it. And I was, I was <laughs> hack times 10, actually, in relation to what he was doing. So, um, so we had a real rapport. And I still think that of anyone working today, he is the most adventurous as far as type and drawing uh, goes, as far as just producing amazing work nonstop. He doesn't really have... A client base, but he's just generating work. He taught at CalArts for a really long time and just retired last year. Um, but I, I became friends with him and I really studied his work and he would come and visit a couple times to, to Cranbrook and then you know I came down and I, I did some teaching alongside him. We did some critiques and things and so he's someone who just the whole way that he's kind of modeled his life is something that I really value as a, a, a a terrific influence. Any any newbies you're excited about? Or? Oh, gee, I see. I knew he was going to ask. Me yeah, that. you know. I'm looking right now. Other than Nancy. Oh. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Oh, it's right. <laughs> Nancy. Um, I'm looking right now at a lot of these young photographers who mm-hmm. are, and I can't give you their names because I just learned them. I went to one of their lectures. I think it was Daniel Gordon, I believe was his name. I'm embarrassed now because you're tape recording my not even remembering who I just saw. Daniel Gordon, yes, I was right. Um, who are who are looking at photography as as a way of constructing these new realities and all. And it's really exciting because I kind of did this thing independently. And when you find that there's like this whole tribe that you at least tangentially can be a part of and you understand where they're coming from and it's what you were thinking about. It's really exciting and I feel like it's kind of this whole new birth of investigation and creativity Mm -hmm. which I I still feel like I'm a designer using photography but it's not completely in opposition to the way that some these young photographers are looking at it as, as a tool. They're photographers almost creating design, so they're almost going in the other way, and we're kind of meeting in the middle. Yeah. So I haven't met them personally, uh, but I just discovered their work, and so that's something that really excites me. And I usually look outside of design itself to find people that interest me, um, in musicians, filmmakers a lot, um, these kinds of things, uh, because they they all have to use design mm-hmm. in different ways and and using all different aspects of it. 2D, 3D, interactive, lighting, all, all this kind of thing to make these whole uh, um, um, universes of logic in their work and all the work that they do. Right. And that's what I really am excited about. Well, Nancy, thank you very much. Thank you. And Martin, thank Thanks, you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Appreciate you being here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.